This lecture will present some of my recent PhD research into the agricultural buildings of 14th century England. I will use this work as a basis and add some discussion of medieval farms in Ireland, primarily drawing on research into the area around Dublin. I'm going to focus on the animal houses within these farmyards because they are often neglected and can show us many interesting aspects of medieval life. Of particular interest to me are the dovecots and sheep houses of these manors. Most of the research on medieval agriculture has focused on the great barns that still stand in the landscape today. We have considered these buildings to be symbols of wealth, power and authority. I gave a paper to the Borderlands Conference in Belfast many years ago where I proposed that this interpretation was due to the size and position of these barns. Whether this is correct I will discuss later. However, our focus on barns has meant that we have ignored the other agricultural buildings. The manorial buildings, such as halls and chapels, are rarely considered in an agricultural context. It's clear that animal houses were just as important as the barns, while kitchens, brew houses and bake, bake houses were also essential buildings for the manor to function. Throughout this paper, I will use the term curia to describe the courtyard of the manorial farmstead. The term comes from the Latin for court and is used in medieval documents. The term is primarily used to refer to the physical buildings and structure of the courtyard. However, it also has legal and social connotations, implying the Lord's Law Court that was held in the hall of the manor. Before we look at the animal houses, it's important to think about the manor and the buildings of the curia. The manorial curia was the working farm of the manor. It contained the barns, ox houses and stables, as well as the manor house with its associated chambers, kitchen, brew house and bake house. We shall now look at a few examples of manorial curiae to understand their layouts. Very few sites have been fully excavated due to the size of the area and the significant expense of excavation. Our first example is the Temple Preceptory of South Witham in Lincolnshire. Here we can see how the agricultural buildings were usually arranged around a court. The domestic buildings were in the centre, marked in red in the plan, while the processing buildings, such as the kitchen and brew house, were to one side. There is a large chapel complex south of the hall because the manor was home to members of the Order of the Templars. The agricultural buildings marked in yellow formed the north and west edges of the court. They were located close to the entrance gates and were as far from the hall as possible. The excavators described most of these buildings as barns, but some of them must have been stables and byres to house the animals. Chalgrove in Oxfordshire provides another example of a curia. Here there is a separate court specifically for the animal houses and the barn. This separate, separated them from the domestic complex to the north. There was also a separate entrance to the south courtyard. The animal houses cannot be identified. The southernmost building may have been an ox house or a cow house. It is possible that there was a cart house and stables in the central block dividing the two yards. The domestic buildings formed a substantial complex to the north with a private walled garden behind the hall. The eastern section contained a kitchen and a chapel, as well as having chambers above the pantry. The whole complex was surrounded by a moat, and the courtyard in front of the domestic buildings was approached across a bridge to the east. To give an Irish perspective on animal housing, we shall look at the site of Cloncurry, County Kildare. Unfortunately, we do not have excavation or earthwork evidence from the site, but there is a detailed documentary description of the buildings and their layout. The reconstruction drawing here uses the documentary and landscape evidence to imagine what the curia might have looked like. Here we can see that there were two courtyards, one for the domestic buildings and another for the agricultural buildings. The agricultural area is labelled Highgard, which is a word sometimes used for farmyard. Both areas were surrounded by ditches. Beside the hole, part of which was ruinous, we see a mott, which can be seen in the landscape today.
similar to the previous examples, loud cultural buildings are grouped together and close to the gates of the courtyard. The layout of the buildings in this reconstruction is slightly more reminiscent of the layout of post-medieval farmsteads, with the circular turning area in the middle of the yard. A better example could be that at Callan Mott, County Kilkenny. Like Cloncurry, Callan Mott has not been excavated. However, this time we do have a geophysical survey to base our reconstruction on. Here we can see what was a Mott and Bailey castle. The manorial hall, chamber and kitchen were constructed on top of the Mott, while the agricultural buildings were located in the Bailey. Access to the domestic buildings was through the farm. This is similar to the arrangement at South Witham, but visitors to Callan were forced to pass closer to the agricultural buildings. This type of layout has been used to suggest that lords designed the approach to their halls and used their agricultural buildings as symbols of wealth and authority. Callan Mott supports this idea as the domestic buildings were placed on the Mott above the farm and the two areas would have been seen together by the visitor. We shall now think a bit about the types of animals that were housed on the manor. Horses were the most valuable animals, as they cost the most at market and were used for putting agricultural equipment as well as riding. They were therefore housed in stables so that they could be fed additional fodder and to keep them healthy. Oxen were also given houses to keep them healthy, as they were needed for the plough and the cart. Cows would have spent a lot of their time grazing in the fields, but sometimes they were also housed in the same building as the oxen. The cows would have needed housing when calving, and some manors may have had sheds for milking. Chickens were also kept within the curia. Their coops were timber structures, probably against the wall or within another building. They were often given the freedom of the farmyard and were cared for by the dairy maid. Doves or pigeons were also kept in a dovecot within the curia and were free to fly anywhere in the surrounding countryside. Some animals, particularly pigs and sheep, were housed outside the curia. Pigs spent part of their year foraging in the woods for pannage, eating beech mast and nuts. They were also fed on the leftover from malt kilns from the broom process. There is evidence of a pigsty beside the malt house of Castle Caprari within the agricultural complex. Sheep were often grazed on upland pastures, and their houses were constructed near to these pastures. Some manors may have housed their sheep within the curia, but it was more common to find a specialist complex of buildings known as burkery, where there was housing for different categories of sheep and even dairy facilities. We'll discuss sheep housing in more detail later. A few manors had kennels for dogs and mews for hawks. These were associated with hunting and were for the entertainment of the lord and his guests. Most of the buildings within the curia were constructed from timber framing and roofed with thatch. Between the timber posts were panels of wickerwork, which were daubed with plaster. This would not have looked like the black and white contrast mock timber framing we see on buildings today. Rather, the walls would have been daubed with an off-white plaster and the timber would not have been painted or treated and may not even have been exposed. Medieval thatch would have looked very similar to a modern thatch roof, except that modern roofs tend to have a more decorative ridge line than their predecessors. In some places, such as Wiltshire, where stone was plentiful, tiles were used to roof a wider selection of buildings, and stone was more commonly used for halls and barns. But even in such stone-rich areas, timber framing was still widely used for the animal housing and other agricultural buildings. Stone was also used in timber framed buildings. Sill walls were constructed to underpin the timber walls. These were only a foot high and were probably dry stone constructions. This meant that damp was less likely to get into the timbers and cause them to decay. These walls also allowed builders to remove and replace the sole plate at the foot of the wall if it ever became damaged. There was some differentiation in the materials of buildings for different animals. As I noted earlier, 
The majority were timber framed and thatched, but occasionally stables were roofed with tiles. Chicken houses and kennels were usually entirely timber. For most of these sites, we can see that the barns and animal houses were placed beside the entrances. It is possible that these barns were placed there to use their size as a symbol of wealth and power. We shall now think a bit about the meanings of buildings and how they have been viewed by others. Buildings have always been endued with symbolism, which took many forms. From the pyramids of Egypt to the cathedrals of Europe, buildings were built to impress those who viewed them. Medieval countryside was full of single-storied peasant houses, mostly built of wattle and daub and roofed with thatch. In the later Middle Ages, wealthy peasants could add a second storey to their buildings and in towns, multiple storey buildings were common. But across most of the countryside, the church was the largest building. This collection of insignificant buildings gives us some context for the manorial curia. Manorial buildings were larger than most of the other buildings within the village, particularly the barns. It has been argued that barns were constructed as a symbol of wealth and as a display of the Lord's authority. When we look at the great barns of medieval England, such as Great Coxwell, Breeden and Harmsworth, we see why this interpretation has developed. These were impressive buildings and represent a major investment of money, resources and labour. In particular, the great stone barns were at least five times more expensive than their timber counterparts. It has also been noted that the medieval author Langland uses the barn as a symbol of authority in his story of Piers Plowman. Piers had a dream about God and the final judgment, much of which took place inside a barn. However, the position of the barn within the Curia suggests that it was of less importance as has been stressed in the past. Most barns were located beside the gate of the Curia. Stables and ox houses were also found in this location in some manners indicating that it was not a position of prestige. Rather, it was a very functional position for a barn, as carts could pass through the building without having to enter the inner courtyard. This reduced the mess created within the curia, with carts and oxen churning up the mud surfaces of the yard. This functional approach suggests that these buildings were not primarily symbols of wealth. Barns do have some elements of decoration, such as the finials on the roof of Middle Littleton, which do suggest a form of display, but these cannot be used to suggest a defining aspect when the vast majority of the building is given over to its functional purposes. However, some buildings did have an aspect of symbolism. The main building associated with symbolism was the dovecot. It has often been said that dovecots were symbols of lordship, presumably because owning doves was a manorial privilege. Doves were expensive to keep, as they ate a lot of grain from the village fields. Lords did not want their tenants' doves eating their crops, so they did not allow peasants to keep them. It should be noted that although we use the term dove, the Latin culver included both doves and pigeons. The distinctions in the birds that we see today developed in the post-medieval period, when pigeon keeping became a major pastime. Keeping doves may have been a manorial privilege, but it was not only the lords who ate doves. Doves were a delicacy in the inns and taverns of medieval England. There were many ways to prepare them, mostly as pies or stews, and they were basically served as bar food. Doves provided food for most of the year due to their breeding cycles. This provided the Lord with a good supply of meat in times when other meats were scarce. Doves are quite small animals, but dovecots are very large buildings. Many of them were built from stone as circular structures with the nest holes on the inside. A large ladder, which could be moved around, was used to access the nests and remove the squabs, the young doves. Timber dovecots also existed in the Middle Ages. Few of these have survived, so we cannot tell exactly what they were like, but it is likely that they were square structures rather than round. From the manners that I have examined, and particularly from the royal estate of Holderness, 
in Yorkshire, it is evident that the dovecots were only constructed on manors where the lord stayed. In Holderness, Burstwick was the only manor to have a dovecot, and this was also the only manor that accommodated the king and his household. Dovecots were expensive to build, and doves were expensive to keep, so they were only kept where they were consumed regularly. Therefore, where we find the dovecot, it indicates that this was an important manor or farmstead. We can see from a comparison of the cost of new buildings that a stone dovecot costs more than a timber dovecot and about twice the cost of a timber barn, which was many times bigger. If doves were simply a food, then they could have been housed in a building like a chicken house, a simple timber structure with perches for the birds. So why spend all that money on building for such small animals? Doves were not just food. As I mentioned earlier, only the lords were allowed to keep doves. This meant that they were associated with the authority of the lord. Medieval society was not entirely peaceful, and some peasants enjoyed stealing their lord's meat. Deer parks, rabbit warrens and fish ponds were common targets for poachers to steal game. Lodges were constructed in deer parks for the gamekeepers to live and protect the deer. Buildings were constructed for the warreners so they could protect the rabbits. The king has a number of warrens on his estate of Holderness in Yorkshire, and all, all with buildings for the warrener. Doves were another animal that was often poached. Therefore, lords constructed buildings to protect the doves. The stone dovecots were the most secure method of protecting the birds, providing strong walls and a small door. Even a timber dovecot provided a substantial obstacle to poachers. The doors of these buildings were also always secured with padlocks, making it harder for poachers to break into the building. Dovecots were also usually located beside the domestic buildings, or in a prominent position outside the curia. This may partly have been for the security of the birds, as this was the most secure area of the curia, and the reeve was able to observe the dovecot. It seems odd for an animal house to be placed beside the hall. Usually only stables were placed here to allow visitors to house their horses when they arrived. Doves were quite messy animals, like modern day pigeons. They went to the toilet everywhere, particularly around their dovecot and its surrounding buildings. Medieval texts suggest that doves and poultry were viewed differently to other animals. Poultry was left in the care of the dairy maids although cockerels were often thought to be too violent and sexual. Doves were also associated with the poultry and seen as positive influence. Bartholomew Angelicus described them as messenger of peace, example of simpleness, clean of kind, plentiless in children, follower of meekness, friend of the company, forgetter of wrongs. And the image of the dove appears in the Bible to represent purity. This suggests that the presence of the doves around the hall was seen as a good thing for the Lord, and it might explain why the dovecot was placed here. So, dovecots did act as a display of the Lord's authority. A dovecot is associated with high status dining, high cost of animals, manorial privileges, and the danger of poaching. None of these aspects alone made the dovecot a symbol of display, but when combined, they do make it a status symbol, and thus make it an agent for these social perceptions. Now we shall turn to animals that were less symbolic, but more economically important in medieval England. Sheep were not symbols of authority and wealth. Their sheep houses were not even prominent within the curia, but they were important in the economy of the manor. Wool was a very important product of the banners and an important export. Many abbeys in the north, such as Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire, were built from the proceeds of wool production, while other abbeys and lords used downland to graze large flocks of sheep. Battle Abbey kept massive flocks on the Sussex Downs at Old System, up to 2,900 sheep, and Glastonbury Abbey had manors in Wiltshire with access to Chalk Downland where they kept 1,200 animals. English wool was highly sought after, 
In the 14th century, a significant amount of it was shipped to the Low Countries to produce high-quality Flemish cloth. In the later Middle Ages, profit from the wool trade was used by merchants to build impressive churches such as those at Laycock and Olfriston. Sheep spent a lot of their time grazing on the pastures in the hills. A 14th century text from France, written by Jean de Brie, recommends that the sheep be housed overnight, even in the summer. Similar practices may be followed in England, although they were probably left out for long periods in the better weather during the summer. Within the fields, it is likely that sheep had temporary movable pens. These would also have been used on the arable fields when the sheep were folded there overnight. This put extra manure into the fields and increased their fertility. The most famous image of a sheep cot is from the Duke of Berry's Book of Hours. Many scholars have taken this winter image to represent sheep being housed in their cot over the winter. This image clearly shows a sheep house full of sheep within a farm enclosure. The building is long and thin with one entrance in the long wall. Thus it is much like the sheep houses described by Dyer in Gloucestershire. However, we can also see the structure of the rest of the building. The sheep house has walls woven with ease and is roofed with thatch. There also appears to be a large gap between the wall and the roof. This image alters reality for artistic effect and the building portrayed probably has more in common with temporary sheepfolds or woven hurdles that sheep houses of the 14th century. However, the manorial accounts and field surveys show that sheep houses were more substantial buildings. Many had stone footings to the walls and most walls were timber framed. The stone footings allowed the ground sills to be lifted off the earth and prevented damp getting to them. We also learn from Jean de Brie that occasionally the windows of the sheep house should be closed to keep the wind out. This would be impossible in the Duke of Berry's illustration, but quite possible in a building with timber framed walls. In the manorial accounts, there are often references to the purchase of locks for the sheep houses and repairs to the doors. This indicates that there were proper doors on these buildings, not like the open doorways illustrated here. The farming treatises stress the importance of protecting the sheep within their house. The roofing of all sheep houses was thatch. The majority were straw thatch, but a few were roofed with reed thatch. This at least is consistent with the illustration. We can even see that part of the thatch has come away to reveal the spars that were first laid on the roof to support the thatch and tie it down. All these details indicate that cheap houses were more substantial buildings than some medieval art suggests. These were long buildings, often found in clusters with other smaller buildings and associated with enclosures and pasture. Sheep houses were long, narrow buildings. Chris Dyer's study of sheep houses in Gloucestershire shows that there was a large range in the size of sheep houses. They ranged in area from 170 square metres up to 520 square metres, the largest being at Kington Hill and measuring 65 metres in length and 8 metres in width. Most sheep houses identified by Dyer were between 40 metres and 50 metres long and 7 metres wide. All Dyer's plans show long, narrow buildings, most with entrances in one long wall. Some of these are also suggest multiple phases of construction, while others had smaller buildings appended to their ends. This can be seen at Kinnaton Hill, where a number of small buildings have, have been added and rebuilt. Some of these clusters of buildings were also independent farms, occasionally called burkeries, and some developed into farmsteads. On the hillside above Longbridge Deverell is a farm that is known today as Lord's Hill Farm. It is likely that this was the location of the Manor Sheep House. It sits on the edge of the grass downland on a road leading away from the village and up the hillside. This meant that it had easy access to grassland for pasture, the fields of the village for grazing stubble and folding, 
and the manner for storing wool and transporting other goods. The manorial accounts do not tell us the size of the sheep cut, but they do tell us the cost. It is possible to graph the change in the cost over the 14th century. This shows that there was a clear increase in the cost of sheep house construction after the Black Death, even taking into account inflation. The costs have been adjusted for inflation here. A reason for the increase in expenditure was that the size of the sheep houses has increased. A large sheep cot needed more material and would therefore have cost more to construct. It is possible that these larger houses were constructed to accommodate more sheep. There appears to have been an increase in the size of sheep flocks in the 1350s, but it quickly returned to just above pre-Black Death levels. This increase in the size of flocks may have had an influence on the lords as they built new sheep houses, with the intention of having a large flock. This average flock size blurs the variation of individual manors. In some years, a manor could massively increase its flock, such as at Redgrave, where there were 162 sheep in 1337, 451 in 1340, and 729 in 1343. Redgrave is one of the manors that constructed a new sheep house, but it waited until 1345, when its flock was over four times larger than it had been just six years earlier. Therefore, we can suggest that the construction and increased size of these sheep houses shows that lords were more concerned with the welfare and living conditions of their sheep than they had been in the first half of the 14th century. One of the most interesting aspects of agricultural buildings is the locks for the doors. Locks appear to have been partly functional and partly symbolic. They did prevent thieves from breaking into the buildings and stealing goods and animals. But they also had an element of symbolism, representing the authority and control of the Lord over the buildings, their contents and the peasants. It's likely that the reeve was responsible for unlocking the buildings and acted on behalf of the Lord. The rules of Robert Grottetesti state that the opening of barns had to be supervised. This suggests the reeve was not entirely trusted with the responsibility. All animal houses and most buildings within the curia were locked with a padlock. But sheep houses prove one of the more interesting examples. As the sheep house was often at some distance from the curia, it's unlikely that the reeve would have travelled up to the sheep house every morning and night to unlock and lock the building. This means that the shepherd was trusted with the key to the sheep house and control of the building. Shepherds may have been trusted more than reeves when it came to opening and closing the buildings because they were usually employees of the manor rather than officials elected by the ville or the village. Therefore, they were directly responsible for the care of the sheep and could have lost their job for failing to look after them. They are more likely to have been trusted and it is also more difficult to steal sheep than some grain from the barn. One of the most important conclusions to draw from this research is that the Curia was a functional farmyard. Ideas of symbolism have been placed on certain buildings, particularly the barn, but it's often forgotten that they were constructed for a purpose and that function was their main concern. The Curia had a practical layout with the houses of the largest animals and the barns nearest the entrances and the domestic buildings set furthest from that entrance. Why this layout should be reversed in the post-medieval period is another paper and a study for another day. But it is evident that the curia was arranged to streamline the agricultural processes that happened within it. Barns and animal houses were located near the gates to prevent animals and carts walking through the courtyard and damaging the surfaces. This layout controlled the flow of people and animals through the curia and kept messy activities away from the domestic buildings. It is also evident that the animals of the manor were well cared for. All of them had buildings that provided them shelter. Some were kept within the curia, under the care of the reeve and the famulus, while others were housed near the areas they grazed. All animals were protected, 
although some were given a special status. Doves appear to have been the best looked after, as they had very large and very expensive houses. They were often placed closest to the hall, despite being relatively dirty birds. These houses reflect their symbolism as a sign of lordship and authority. Sheep were valued for their wool and cheese during this period. They were housed most nights and were let out to graze for most of the year. Thus, they were housed near the upland where they could graze on the best grass. The care of these animals was entrusted to a shepherd who was expected to be gentle and caring to his sheep. He was also trusted by the Lord and Reeve because he was given the key to the sheep house rather than needing the Reeve to open the building every morning and close it every night. I hope this paper has shown how the high status sites of the Middle Ages were not all about symbolism and ceremony. These were working farms. The buildings were built to protect the animals. And we can tell much about this from looking at the materials of the buildings themselves. There were some elements of display in the construction of a dovecot and the decoration of a barn. But these were minimal compared to the size of the buildings and their functional construction. Most buildings were built to last and were constructed with the intention to maintain. These were not insubstantial buildings that were regularly replaced. Therefore, special animals received special care, but all animals received protection and housing. Thank you.